Night Flight Panama Radio 24, welcome into the lounge. Uh, at the lounge this evening, we'll be talking about the Early Autism Project Malaysia EAP. If you know what that is, good on you. If you don't, stay with us. Uh, we'll give you some information about that. Apparently, it's estimated that one out of every 600 children in Malaysia is born with autism, and recent statistics show that some 47,000 of the people within this country are autistic. Of that figure, it is estimated that four out of every 10,000 suffer from severe autism. Well, to talk about the Early Autism Project Malaysia, we have Joshua Bid Isaacs, Director, Senior Supervisor and Psychologist at EAP Malaysia. And also joining her in the studio is Charmaine Quay, uh, Supervisor, Intake and Assessment Coordinator at EAP Malaysia. Good evening, ladies, and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us on uh, Night Flights Lounge. Well, we'll start with you, Joshua Bid. Tell us a little bit about your role as the Director and Senior Supervisor and also a Psychologist at EAP Malaysia. Hi, Gerard. Thanks so much for inviting us here today. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Early Autism Project Malaysia started in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, And at that point, I just started as a supervisor um, with EAP. We're originally from Wisconsin, Early Autism Project, and still affiliated with them. Um, So what we do is we actually provide one-to-one behavioral treatment services for children with autism. They can be center-based, they can be home-based. The reason we're called Early Autism Project is we specialize in early intervention, but we also work with children up to however many years old because the approach that we use can basically be individualized to any child. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charmaine, tell us a little bit about about yourself and uh, your work with the EAP Malaysia, just so uh, those listening to you will uh, know where you're coming from. Yeah. Hello, thank you for having us, Gerard. Um, I'm a supervisor at EAP Malaysia. Um, My role is basically uh, what you would call a case manager. So I oversee a number of children. Um, I do their therapy programming and monitor their progress. Mm -hmm. Um, In addition to that, what I also do at EAP is um, screenings um, and also diagnostic evaluations. And I also conduct developmental assessments. Diagnostic evaluations. That's right. Right, so you conduct all that before... Uh, a child is brought to the center. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Should I call it a center? We are a center. Yeah, yeah. We have. A, I mean, we have to operate from a center, a mm-hmm. service provider. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, children typically come for an initial assessment. Whether right. they, if they already have a diagnosis, then they just come for an initial screening. Right. Um, where people like Charmaine and our other supervisors uh, actually give them give the parents recommendations of mm-hmm. how they can help their child, mm-hmm. um, or if parents feel like there are some symptoms of autism but they're not sure, then they come in for what Shamin just mentioned, a diagnostic evaluation. Right. Uh, for the benefit of the listeners, Joshua Bed will be referred to as Joe from here on end. Yeah. And uh, there's Shamin. That's very straightforward. Well, Joe, yeah, coming yeah. back to you, uh, for those of us who don't know what the Early Autism Project uh, of Malaysia is, can you walk us through that? Of course, you did talk a little bit about yeah. that uh, between uh, Wisconsin and Malaysia. Yeah. There's a little bit of a tie-up. How does it work? Uh, who started the idea? Uh, the uh, um, how did this uh, whole project uh, get on its feet in Malaysia? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, well, what's really important when it comes to the treatment or education of any special need is to actually use a program that is well-established, well-researched, and something that you know really is effective. Uh, and so we in Malaysia are actually really blessed that Wisconsin Early Autism Project started up Early Autism Project in Kuala Lumpur, so it could actually benefit um, fellow Malaysians to receive this sort of treatment, which is what we call Applied Behavioral Analysis, which is ABA. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's basically a behavioral approach to to teaching a child with autism. So you break skills down. So let's say you want to teach a child how to talk. Before you start teaching a child how to talk, you want to check if the child is able to cooperate, able to imitate, able to follow basic basic instructions mm-hmm. um, and copy copy what you're doing. Well, well, how much of research goes through in order to uh, bring this, I mean, uh, to the people or, or to kids who need the help? Uh, how much of research has been done with the ABA or... From what I understand, there are yeah. different methods yep, of sure. teaching. Yeah? So using the ABA, yeah. how long has it been researched and what are the uh, uh, what results have you seen from this? Sure. So um, ABA has been around since the 1970s, um, established by Dr. Iva Lovas. And ov- I mean, it's the most credible intervention for mm-hmm. children with autism to date. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's backed up by research of research papers. So, um, you know, comparison studies and so on internationally. There's over a thousand research papers written internationally supporting this and in fact in the US like in Wisconsin the state government funds it and even the insurance companies fund it Mm -hmm. because what what the research basically shows is that um, with early intervention starting with quite intensive one-to-one treatment about 
35 hours a week actually of one-to-one -one treatment for about three years they see at least 50 percent of the children catching up to being like typical children right so we've actually worked with enough kids in malaysia where not all kids because autism is a spectrum disorder mm -hmm. but half of our children would actually catch up um, to go to school like typical children you wouldn't even say that they have Autism, you can hardly really see it. Right. There's some social difficulties there and some um, social understanding language difficulties, but, but very, very minimal. But that's with quite intensive right. treatment. Uh, you say it's a spectrum disorder. Uh, Charmaine, maybe you can, uh, uh, for those of us who don't know how, it, how it's a spectrum disorder, you can walk us through okay. uh, what that means. Um, so the, the diagnosis of autism highlights two areas of, mm -hmm. um, I guess, um, challenges that these individuals face. Uh, the first one would be social communication and social interaction. The second one would be repetitive, uh, restricted patterns of behaviours. Mm -hmm. So when we say it's a spectrum... Re repetitive? Restricted patterns of mm -hmm. behaviours. So when we say it's a spectrum, you have um, those on the milder end who probably display only very little symptoms, uh, and then you have those on the severe end who are displaying, I guess, more frequent and... and, and, and more um, intense symptoms um, and, and then those in the middle with their own sort of moderate moderate yeah. symptoms yeah <coughs> so so they have different manifestations of, of the two criteria that I've just uh, mentioned earlier right yeah. with autism uh, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people or a lot of uh, the Joe public about autism and every time you speak to them about autism there's always this uh, people uh, I mean, they sometimes uh, uh, think that autism is Down syndrome. They kind of get things mixed up. Why, why, why is there a lack of awareness in this country? Do you think there's a lack of awareness, Joe? I think that there is a lack of understanding. Understanding? I mean, yeah, understanding mm -hmm. of autism. So like what Shamin just explained about the s um, spectrum is actually something that's really important for us as a society to understand. Because if not, you're going to think immediately, oh, autism, very oh, very hard, lah. very mm -hmm. difficult to, mm -hmm. to handle, or oh, always uh, fighting, shouting, screaming. You know, you, you people have a perception that's quite negative of a child with autism. But we have got some kids that we work with that are so sweet mm -hmm. and so kind and so thoughtful. And uh, they just struggle socially, like what Charmaine gave the diagnosis, the social communication or social interaction part. So I think there is a, a massive lack of understanding mm -hmm. um, I don't think people struggle so much anymore to differentiate the two because I think with Down syndrome there's a physical um, a appearance mm -hmm. that, that it's quite obvious uh, that the child has got Down syndrome but with autism I think the understanding is harder, harder to understand because mm -hmm. with Down syndrome if you see a child with Down syndrome having a behavior or difficult you immediately are compassionate because you can see from the outset that this child has special needs mm -hmm. whereas with um, a child with autism they physically like, yeah, yeah they, they, they just look, like look normal kids exactly yeah. mm -hmm. so they just look sometimes like a child that is not behaving very well or that the parents can't handle their child but the very real part for some of our families is for example they might go to a shopping mall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the child has a certain expectation and then that expectation is not met and the child starts getting really, really upset and throws themselves on the floor and all that. And so other society members look at them and go, wow, you can't handle your child. Mm -hmm. But actually, the parent is really struggling to manage right. the child's so, so when it comes to assessing the child, coming back to you, Shami, when it comes to assessing the child, is it quite a challenge simply because there, there's nothing uh, on the appearance? Is it easy to detect if a child has autism? And um, it, can you 100% ascertain that that child has uh, autism? Right, okay, so we always go back to standardized tools uh, yeah. when you're diagnosing or assessing a child, um, and that's the only clear way to confidently say whether the child sits on the spectrum or not. Yeah. Uh, as to whether it's easy to see or not, I guess then it really depends on how severe their autism is. Um, for someone who's probably showing very minimal symptoms, you do have to really uh, look out for specific signs and symptoms that's mm -hmm. um, sort of um, you know, in the tool, that's sort of specified in the tool. But for someone who's probably more severe, uh, you do tend to pick it up quite uh, naturally from observation itself. Um, so it really varies, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it really varies from individual to individual. Right. So how does this work in, in Kuala Lumpur? I mean, um, when they need their kids to be, uh, they need the kids to mm -hmm. go to somewhere to learn uh, skills that, that they need yeah. to have. Uh, yeah. First thing you do is is uh, 
of course, ascertain the degree of autism the child's yeah. suffering from. If they haven't already got a diagnosis, that mm-hmm. is what we would recommend. Right, then what happens after for. that? So then what happens after that is from the diagnosis, we would give our clinical recommendations. Uh, if families do want to enroll in a program, then from that recommendations, the supervisor then comes up with a personalised program for the child. So if we look at um, our curriculum, it's, it's pretty holistic. We cover seven areas. The first one is the early learner skills of cooperation. Uh, imitation and attention, then you've got language and communication, play skills, social skills, daily living skills, um, cognitive and academic skills, and then the seventh area would be the generalization of the six areas I've just mentioned. How long does it take for the kid or or those suffering from autism Mm -hmm. to uh, Mm -hmm. gain something from what they're learning from all these skills or these tools? That as well really comes back down to the individual. I mean, some Mm -hmm. children respond really well to um, therapy, and so then you see quite a marked progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some children who are probably more severely affected by autism may take a longer period of time. So what also happens here at EAP is we do a developmental assessment for all children that you know that's just enrolled with us and that's repeated every year because that then gives us a very clear benchmark in terms of learning rate and what are the areas that, mm-hmm. that still mm-hmm. needs to be focused well, on. Well, you know of you know, young couples who have kids and yeah. you know, they, say they, they notice that something's wrong with their kid mm-hmm. and they want to get an assessment mm-hmm. uh, whether the kid is diagnosed or not. Can you guys handle something like that? Yep, absolutely. That's uh, what we do yeah, every right, week. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, so they, they don't have to go see a doctor and then come to you guys. Um. Well, actually, for a diagnostic evaluation to be done properly and accurately, it has to be conducted either by a developmental pediatrician, mm, a, or develop, a developmental pediatrician, yeah, yeah. Okay. or um a clinical psychologist who's trained in this area of autism. Mm-hmm. So um, just to add to what Charmaine mentioned and your question earlier, Gerard, about right. how easy is it, mm-hmm. I think we want to be very careful with people who give diagnosis very quickly, mm-hmm. like in a five-minute observation or a, mm-hmm. even a 20 or 30-minute. We spend at least two, two, to, three, yeah, two to three hours. Yeah. Uh, there has to be a basic observation. There has to be an interview. Mm-hmm. And you have to use the golden standard, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5, version 5. Mm-hmm. So there's actually a very thorough process of identifying autism in a child yeah. uh, and that needs to be done very well before mm-hmm. someone is just given the you know or you, your child has autism or something mm-hmm. like that so actually on our website autismmalaysia.com there are some screening uh, tools. things tools yeah. that actually will help parents right. just tick off like there's five red flags so parents can just see okay mm-hmm. yeah but, my but child, that's very general yeah then. Mm-hmm. so at least that that at least makes them um, okay aware like maybe my child is yeah. showing some of this and then we recommend the next step to go and get a diagnosis. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll find out more about the, the Early Autism Project Malaysia, or EAP. Joining me in the studio is Josh Abed Isaacs, Director, Senior Supervisor and Psychologist at EAP Malaysia. And also in the studios with us this evening is Charmaine Khoi, a Supervisor, Intake and Assessment Coordinator at EAP Malaysia. We'll be back just after the Top 5 News. Stay with us. Tomorrow's News Today, only on Night Flight. Welcome back to The Lounge on Night Flight Bernama Radio 24. Joining me in the studio is Josh Abed Isaacs, Director, Senior Supervisor and Psychologist at EAP Malaysia. And we're also talking to Sharmin Kuei, Supervisor, Intake and Assessment Coordinator from EAP Malaysia. What is EAP? Early Autism Project Malaysia. Well, uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of interviews that I hear. I went online, listened to some interviews about autism. Mm-hmm. And sometimes... Uh, it becomes too in-depth that people are lost in all that information that's being given out. Um, sure. I think the best way around this for, for people to understand or gain more of an understanding with regards to what's happening is to learn about stories and pair people that that have come into your center and people that you've worked with and touched. Apparently, according to my uh, nephew and godson, who's, who also does the same thing, he says a lot of people, it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, I mean, on the part of the uh, people who are working with these kids, a lot of dedication and passion needs to be yep. put into it. Sure. Uh, what, what's your take on this, Joe? And uh, Charmaine, you can speak normally if you want to I need to sound all newsy <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean uh, you need to love kids first of all so when mm-hmm. when um, new staff come in for interviews and all that we're always looking for kids who uh, for staff sorry who love children mm-hmm. but also who have a commitment to to want to help this child uh, and it can be challenging at times I mean when the child is crying initially or or not really responding mm-hmm. but I mean the reason why I got into it when I was in university in Perth 
uh, we did a summer sort of a summer placement working with children with autism and I was ready to quit after the first or first week or so. Uh, but then suddenly after the second week, this boy started to call my name, right. respond to me, um, follow my instructions. I was shocked because i never seen a program like this, uh, exactly the same type of program that we run at EAP ABA. Um, and he just started to respond and just say so many things and become so cooperative uh, mm-hmm. that it became really intrinsically rewarding. So then you, you wake up every day uh, believing that you are, you know, a, like someone who can bring change to not just the child's life, but to the family's life and and really bring a lot more meaning to that child's world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Charmaine, do you have any experiences that you can share with us? Um, the children always make you smile at the end of the day. Right. Um, you can have the worst day ever and, and they will do something so little. Uh, yeah. We like to joke that we're almost like parents at EAP mm-hmm. because we, we jump for joy over things like requesting to go for the, to the toilet. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, eating even if it's just um, one-tenth of a French fries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We mm-hmm. would celebrate things like that. Uh, but it's, it's all these little things that, that really, really matter at the end of the day. Um, and 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 it's 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 what drives us, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I definitely do agree with you. Right, Drew. right. Yeah. But but with these kids who come in and uh, come in for training, or uh, some sometimes uh, you're taken to their homes, yeah, to meet them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When they don't get to see the people who work with them, what happens then? See, um, usually you have you have someone working with the kids from the center. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What happens when the kid, uh, I mean, there's a long holiday or there's a long break or the person in charge of the kid is not around? Right. Um, one Does of, that happen? Well, one of the factors that, that children with autism or people with autism struggle with is generalization. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, if the child has only one maid that takes care of them all the time, right. the child responds to that one maid but not to anybody else mm-hmm. or really struggles when that child is, uh, when the maid is not around. So one thing that we focus at EAP is on generalization. So every child would have a team of two or three teachers assigned to them. And then because of, let's say, holidays or sick leave, like you mentioned, or um, we actually have replacement therapist so the child gets used to actually working with different people and different children and responding to all the different people but there's definitely what we call post-holiday blues Mm -hmm. where you know after a few days or after the weekend it can be a little bit uh, challenging to get them back into the whole routine of um, working and studying and all that but our program uh, emphasizes on fun Mm -hmm. and uh, I mean that there's a lot of fun in all that we do so if when I worked in America, um, one of the kids just built such a negative association to me because every morning I would start work at 7 in the morning at his house because he was up by 6. Um, and every time I ring the doorbell, he'd be screaming, no, Joe, no, Joe, and running away. Mm-hmm. Then I found out that what was happening was he was on his computer till the moment the, the doorbell rang. Mm-hmm. And then he associated me with being the person that stopped his computer. So we just changed that really quickly. He just had less computer time before I came. Uh, and I started to come in with bags of toys and fun stuff that he loved. And then he just loved the session. So we really try and use the child's interests and fun activities to really build rapport with the child, build relationship, mm-hmm. and to make the, the sessions rewarding. I mean, 35 hours is a lot of time to be with a child. 35 hours in a, a week. week. Yeah, yeah. so it's it. about six to seven hours a day. That's a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of. Um, one-to-one time. Right. So how do you ensure that you have enough uh, trained staff at all times to be uh, looking after uh, uh, the kids or working with kids? Uh, what, what is an intake like and how many kids come in at one time? Yeah, we stick to we stick to quite a strict ratio. We have at least um, about three staff for every two children. Mm-hmm. So we have quite a high ratio of staff, wow. actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, so very different from um, kindergarten or or even international school where it's one or two teachers to 20 kids. Uh, and we don't take intake by terms. We actually take it on an individual basis. Right. So we don't take in a child unless we've got the staff to work with the with the child. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even like Shamin mentioned earlier, she carries a caseload. There's a specific amount of kids that she can carry, so she gives good attention mm-hmm. to each of the kids that, that she works for. Mm-hmm. Shamin, coming back yeah. to the staff, you, you say staff uh, that takes care of the kids. Uh, how how are these staff trained and uh, what backgrounds do they come from? Uh, most of our staff have got backgrounds in psychology, um, early childhood education. Uh, but we also believe that you first and foremost have to have a commitment and passion for children. Um, mm-hmm. 
what they do then go through is a two-week intensive training and then ongoing supervision from someone like myself as right. a supervisor. Uh, Joe's very involved in training. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our business manager herself is also very involved in training. So it's it's at the end of the day, multiple levels of supervision and supporting each other as a team. So essentially what happens uh, in that two weeks mm-hmm. when, when, when you uh, pick uh, these boys and girls or your staff members to come in yeah. to your team, you know, what happens in the two weeks of training? You know, what are they uh, a thought? What are they acclimatized to, you know? Right. Okay. So the training process is very um, practical, hands-on. base, yeah. and hands-on because mm-hmm. uh, you're never going to learn how to play with a child until you get down and play with a child. So right. uh, there's a there's a there's a portion of theory where you learn about what ABA is all about. You know, you learn about the discrete trials, you learn about prompting strategies. But there's also the portion where you then have to go and observe children that you're assigned to, uh, you know, and start to jump in at playtime. So start to play with the kids, start to do some table time with the kids, mm-hmm. um, start to get to know the kids. Yeah and build a good relationship with the kids because that's the foundation to working with all children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We, I must say we are really blessed to have a great team to work with. They're really enthusiastic, energetic. Um, most of our team are fresh grads, um, especially at therapist level. So most would have psychology backgrounds, mental health backgrounds. Some even have PR or communication mm-hmm. because maybe they just love kids mm-hmm. uh, and they want to do something like this. But they come in they really, I think they really catch the culture, they really catch the vision of what we're doing with the children, and then you see them really going out of their way to come up with ideas and all sorts of crazy stuff just to get the children to respond and um, and really interact with them, which is really amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the job that you do is a, is a very fulfilling job, you know, because you see the results, you see kids yeah. improving, and it, it happens to anyone who helps with the development of kids, be it a martial arts teacher right. or someone doing what you do. But with what you do and uh, the good work you guys do, there are, there are also a set of challenges that come along with it. And what would those challenges be, Jo? Um, I think sometimes maybe... maybe uh, I, I think, well, the challenges we probably face are with maybe sometimes you might have a child that is try- you're trying so hard and right. the child is also trying so hard and the parents are also trying. But then with the level of autism, it's it's quite aff- affecting the child. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of our maybe lower moments are when we, we try every different avenue, but the child is not able to speak. Uh, still, so we try lots of different avenues, and and because of the way the spectrum works, some children actually s- remain nonverbal. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a personal struggle that yeah. all of us, especially at a supervisory level, and even therapists do struggle with. So we try lots and lots of different strategies. But I must say, um, one the main saving grace is working as a team, and mm-hmm. that's really important because I think to work in isolation. Uh, you can only be as good as yourself, I suppose. But when you have a team, like when I go in and, and check out Charmaine's kids that she, that she works for or works with, um, I get so many ideas from her and she also gleans ideas from me. So when you work as a team, you actually have that support and that moral support. Uh, and of course, I think sometimes you have uh, very high expectations of, of families because obviously, you know, they want their child to really improve mm-hmm. and really and, change. And, and, and like any mom and dad who's sending their kid for... Uh, any kind of training or yeah. any form of training, they want to see progress. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And I, I absolutely understand understand that. Um, so that's where we try our, our very best. So we're absolutely 100% committed. And that's why we talk about supervision levels because even as a new staff member, you might... You might be new and you might have that two-week training, but on every alternate week, you're at least meeting a supervisor for a team meeting for that child. You're getting overlapped by another therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, your supervisors are coming into the team meeting at least on a fortnightly basis. Mm-hmm. I come in myself personally ev- to visit every child um, every other month. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the levels of training and support are so many that you don't get stuck and isolated, which is something that I did feel, uh, I think, when I was working as a therapist on my own in Perth. Mm-hmm. Uh, because sometimes you really don't know what you to do. You were in Perth. Yeah, when mm-hmm. I was studying. Malaysia, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, then sometimes you just get stuck. You don't know what to do with the situation right. or, or with what's happening. Uh, but with the support structures we've put in place and the supervision, we just make sure that, that people are supported and that as a team we're providing the best service that we can for each individual child. Mm-hmm. So that's why it is quite intensive and it, everything is personalized and individualized. So we also have regular fortnightly clinic meetings where all the supervisors and sit together and discuss our children and discuss um, the difficulties that some of our kids may be facing or if we're stuck in a certain area. Um, so I must say that helps yeah. the challenges be less challenging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shamin, with with kids oh, who uh, need training, especially kids, 
uh, with autism. Uh, what about the aggressive kids? There are some kids that are aggressive. How do you work with them? And while whilst you're doing that, uh, there, there are lots of nuggets of information, Joe. I want you to think about this. Things that we don't know as a uh, general public, stuff that we don't know about autism. Maybe you can think about a few points yeah. to share with us. In the meantime, Charmaine, coming back to you, you know, kids who are aggressive, uh, how do you deal with them? You know, you've got staff or they're trained staff, but uh, uh, how do you deal, deal with overly aggressive kids? Yeah, I think um, firstly, when it comes to behavior, we need to understand that all behavior is a communication. It's a form of communication. So really understanding, you know, what is this child trying to communicate to us? Because you can try out all different kinds of strategies, but until you address what the child is trying to communicate to you, uh, only will you then address the behavior effectively. So at EAP, we have a a golden rule. You always Mm -hmm. assess the function of the behavior, then you decide on an appropriate strategy. And when we we go based on that for every. You always assess behavior. Uh, the the behavior, and then you work on an appropriate strategy. That's that's how it works. Yeah. But when, when you when you talk about kids who are aggressive, uh, mm-hmm. who are kids suffering from autism, mm-hmm. who are aggressive, mm-hmm. you know how aggressive can get, uh, can they get? You know what's the degree of aggression can a ca- right. child show? Okay. On, on the more severe end of the spectrum, you do get children with autism who do engage in self-injurious behaviours. So yeah. probably things like, you know, banging their head against the wall, uh, biting their hands, for example. Uh, so that, that's on the severe end of the spectrum. Um, there are children who, you know, just engage in quite severe tantrum behaviours, uh, but there's no self-injurious element to that. So, so that would be probably one notch down. Uh, but if, if, you, if you're talking about really aggressive behaviour, then the self-injury would be, would be one of the highest top ranking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So EAP has got its own strategy on how to work with kids. There are different uh, different uh, centres in Malaysia and different uh, NGOs working mm-hmm. towards uh, one goal, which is to understand autism mm-hmm. better. Yeah. And how do you guys work together or collect information or data that's relevant for people within the industry? Is, there, is that... Uh, well, at this point, we haven't um, really ventured that much into research yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We are almost, I guess we're reaching our eighth eighth birthday so Mm -hmm. uh, we we haven't established that very well yet we do work in uh, some sort of partnerships like we would uh, attend conferences and workshops and also organize conferences where we can network together mm-hmm. and somehow work together. I think with EAP, the approach that we use is ABA. So there's lots of, like especially in America and Western countries, lots of ABA providers that are very um, well trained in the field of ABA. Uh, I think with NGOs, especially in Malaysia, I think a lot of them have started out of the, the heart and compassion to really just help children with special needs and and with something like 35 hours a week you need a lot of resource and a lot of time and a lot of NGOs are Mm -hmm. trying their level best with volunteers and with very little funding and so on Um, what we try to do as much as we can is to invite and to partner together in fact this year, we were able to provide two scholarships for kids to come to our center. Mm-hmm. Um, and then next year, we also are looking at partnering with certain NGOs who would like us to come in and maybe give some suggestions or support um, to that particular center and specifically in the area of autism. A lot of centers, though, actually do address multiple um, difficulties or developmental disabilities, uh, but we primarily focus on autism. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, for the benefit of the listeners, ABA is Applied Behavioral Analysis. That's if you want to go Google that uh, yeah. right now. In the meantime, uh, well, uh, I asked you for some yeah. information. Sure. Yeah. Do you do you have anything for us? Anything yeah. out of the ordinary? You know, we. Uh, I did. I did a little bit of research that day about Malaysians and how much we read. Apparently, yeah. we read about two pages a year. Wow. <laughs> so. Does that include Facebook or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if that includes <laughs> Facebook. That's a good question, though. Well, uh, com- coming back to information that <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, s- things that we don't know sure. about autism or things we ought to know about autism. Okay, so um, there's like probably four main things that I would really like to emphasize maybe today. One very quick one is that autism is a spectrum disorder. I know we've talked about it before, but until we really get that, uh, we will always have a perspective that autism is either a lot more severe based on movies that we've watched Mm -hmm. or based on some story that we heard about somebody. Um, And I think that's very important that autism is a spectrum disorder and every child with autism, even in the different spectrums, are totally different from each other. And Mm -hmm. that's why individualized programming works. There's individuality 
disability within autism. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Huge, mm-hmm. huge, hugely. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that many people are not aware how much the degree a child of aut- with autism actually can change. So we've worked with multiple children that after two or three years have gone back to the same psychologist who diagnosed them with autism. And the, and the psychologist says in Singapore or America, they say, look, we can't see the signs anymore. Mm-hmm. This child is in a way, um, you know, sort of recovered in a way we use that word carefully but basically they don't show enough s- symptoms of autism anymore to qualify as having autism um, so that's the second thing uh, the third thing is just basically that when you want to teach a child with autism they need a specific way to learn and I think sometimes we just want the child to conform and to just learn like everybody else but the child is already so different so so the strategies that we use with ABA is, is very very simple if you just want to teach a child with, with autism, you just need to break the skill down. So make it so easy that the child gets it. You reward that learning and then you repeat that. Mm-hmm. So if you want to teach a child to imitate, learn how to bang a drum or something, you need to make it so simple that the child is successful and willing to learn. Mm-hmm. You pair that with reinforcement and then you repeat it so that the child really gets it. And it's incredible because we see children from not speaking nonverbal and then start speaking fluently. One of the kids that I work with for the last seven years now, when I started with him, he was absolutely nonverbal. Now he's so chatty, he negotiates. We have arguments and, I mean, good arguments. But uh, like when I told him that I'm pregnant, I said, I've got something really important to tell you. I'm pregnant. And he just looked at me and he said, is that a good thing? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, let's try that again. I'm pregnant, you should say congratulations. Mm-hmm. So basically, socially, he still struggles a little bit. Right. But I mean, enough for him to go, okay, so being pregnant, is that a good thing? And then when I was throwing up so badly, he said, okay, so is the baby still there or not? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, just mm-hmm. socially, it's so in- inappropriate and people right. can get offended. Right. But yet he doesn't mean it at all and mm-hmm. he's just, you know. People able- like that are really good for radio. <laughs> yeah, you <he> should come <laughs> and visit. And so then the the last thing, just very quickly, is that, Whatever you want to increase, like you asked Charmaine about um, aggressive behaviors, Mm -hmm. whatever behavior you want to increase is what you give attention to. That's a basic principle for all children, but many parents Mm -hmm. and family members don't realize it. So if you want to work on social skills, you just just increase uh, working on social skills and that will kind of stand out. Uh, In a way, but actually Mm -hmm. what I meant was like if a child bangs his head on the wall, and you give that child attention, like, hey, 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 stop that, or don't do that, why are you That's doing that? That's a big that? no-no. That behavior is going to increase mm-hmm. because the child's getting attention and right. getting rewarded for that. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about communication and behaviors, when a child is doing a certain behavior, they're communicating something. Mm-hmm. It's either they're communicating frustration or they're communicating, I want to get your attention. Mm-hmm. So we had kids who like to say hi, just comes down and whacks your shoulder, whack, 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 because that's how he thinks you say hi. Because everyone goes, oh, there's a big reaction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he gets the reaction that he wants. So then that becomes his mode of communicating to say hi. So then that's what I mean by if you... if. But what we don't do is when the child is sitting nicely or eating his food nicely or, you know, quietly watching a movie or reading a book, that's the time when we should say, hey, I really like your behavior or great job, but we don't give attention to those things. And so, unfortunately, the behaviors that increase sometimes are the inappropriate behaviors, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, which is what is really important. Wow, there's just so much to learn about this. Uh, <laughs> Hence why we, yeah, it takes a long time to learn, yeah. Well, uh, with regards to EAP, is there any more information you would like to give up before we sign off, Shamin? Yeah, we would just like to share that we'll be hosting a conference on the 8th of November, Mm -hmm. um, Bridge the Gap 2014, with Mm -hmm. a specific focus on how to manage challenging behaviours. So we do urge, uh, you know, families or teaching professionals or any professionals for that matter who need support in this area, do sign up for the conference because... Mm -hmm. Where um, is the conference? Uh, When is it going to be held? So it's going to be held at Bukit Kera Equestrian Club. It's on the 8th of November, um, a morning event, so from 8.30 to 12.30. We are honoured to have our consultant from the States, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Perrin, to come and speak on this topic. Dr. Joseph? Perrin. Perrin, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's from Wisconsin Early Autism Project. Uh, We've also got Dr. Elvin Ng, who's going to give a keynote speech at the conference. And then supervisors like myself will be doing a workshop, a practical workshop, uh, and really teaching parents uh, the strategies and how to implement them. So yeah. do come along. Mm-hmm. Um, We've intentionally kept the price uh, really affordable so right. families can um, afford it. And I'm not sure, Shamin, whether you'll be willing to extend the early bird. Right. The early bird actually ended last week, but mm-hmm. I think we're willing to extend yep. it. Yeah, we can uh, definitely do that. Yeah, yeah so mm-hmm. it's only 99 ringgit per right. person. 99 ringgit yep. per person. Is that right? right? 
Mm-hmm. Or 95, sorry. 95. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From 99, we've gone down 95. Yeah. Bring it down a bit more, girls. Come <laughs> on. Uh. And if you sign up, I think four people, it's only 340 ringgit, yeah. mm-hmm. which works out to 85 yeah. ringgit. Right. So it's 95 ringgit. It's happening at the equestrian. Uh, Bukit Carrier Equestrian. Yeah. Club. Bu- yeah. Right. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, ha- it happens on the 8th of November. It's yeah. on the 8th. Of November, if I need more information, uh, can I Google this or get more information from a website? Yep, you can visit www.autismmalaysia.com and you'll get all the information you need on our website. That's uh, www.autismmalaysia.com. You'll get all the information uh, you want. Before I let you go, uh, your cl- your take-home message, uh, Joe, with regards to autism and uh, the upcoming conference. Yeah, I think, um, well... I must say for someone like myself who's worked almost 10 years in the field, I'm still surprised every day by children with autism. There's so much to learn uh, and so much to to just get from from this whole job. I think that if you're a family member uh, of a child with autism, definitely there is hope and Mm -hmm. there's always, always hope to to change and to see your child progress. I think for people working in this field, um, great on you. Stay committed to this and and definitely it's an, it's a rare opportunity that we get to work with these children and to really make a difference in their lives. Yeah. Um, in addition to the conference on the 8th of November, I would really encourage if you can make it for it because Dr. Perrin is, has years and years of experience. He's coming all the way from Madison, Wisconsin um, and also the breakout session which the supervisors will be running will be interactive. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, you can visit on our website, there's a blog which is actually updated on a weekly basis so that people all over Malaysia can actually access or all over the world can access resources, videos, teaching guidelines and so on um, for for their kids with autism. Mm-hmm. Charmaine? Um, I'd just like to add that we're also giving out some free parent training slots uh, in through the conference. Um, free slots for professionals and um, free career spotting slots for students. So right. terms and conditions training slots for parents, free slots for? Free training slots for professionals mm-hmm. um, and what you would call a day at EAP for students who are probably interested in finding out more about this field of work. Yeah, yeah. so... With that, thank you very much, uh, ladies. We just spoke to Joshua Bet Isaacs, the director, senior supervisor, and psychologist at EAP Malaysia, and Sharmin Kwe, the supervisor, intake and assessments coordinator at EAP Malaysia. Don't forget, it's happening. The conference, once again, if you need more information, all you need to do is log on to www. AutismMalaysia.com And you'll get all the info you need about yeah. this upcoming project or rather conference put together by the Early Autism Project Malaysia. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank, Thank you, Jaran. Thank, Thank you, you very much.